words I would like to direct our attention to come from Luke 22, verses 31 to 34. There we read, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you all as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. Jesus directs this solemn warning to Simon Peter. Simon is his given name. Jesus names him Peter, the rock. But this warning is really for everyone. Satan has asked to sift all of you, you all, you plural, as we would say, y'all. You're all included in this. Now is the moment of your testing. Satan, meaning the accuser, has demanded you. He's asked to sift you as wheat. And what Jesus is referring to is the final process of refining wheat in the ancient world. First, there's threshing, laying the wheat out, beating it to separate the wheat from the chaff. Then there's winnowing, using a winnowing fork to throw it up in the air. The wind takes some of the chaff away. But the final stage of the process is to take a sieve, like a large basket, and to shake it vigorously, to get the final particles of chaff out, whatever remaining dirt or contaminants might be in there, so that what is left is only pure wheat, what is edible. And so Jesus is saying, Simon, the accuser, Satan, he wants to shake you out, to see what you're made of, to see what's left, to see what remains. Now is this time of sifting for all of you. You've been warned. This is still a word for us now. Both in a general sense and in a particular sense. In a general sense, here we are two years after the arrival of COVID. And for so many churches, this has been a season of sifting. Satan is seeing what we're made of. He is filtering out the posers and the pretenders and the false professors, and he's seeing who is real, who has saving faith, real faith, faith in Christ and in Christ alone. We're all passing through that season of sifting. But in a more particular way, we're in the midst of Holy Week. We find ourselves at this time in the calendar when we're looking toward the cross of Jesus. And any time we come face to face with the cross of Jesus, we're facing a time of testing. Because what you do with the cross of Jesus, what you do with his death by crucifixion, really determines where you stand in relation to him. It really shows whether or not you are wheat or chaff. It shows whether or not you can endure the sifting and the violent shaking of the accuser. It's a test for me, it's a test for you, it's a test for all of us. Face to face with this cross, what do you say? What will you do with it? Satan wants to shake you. 
Now, for many of us, we would say, well, of course, if I came face to face with this figure with horns and a pitchfork, he's never going to get the best of me. And the reality is that the real Satan, the real accuser, the evil one, would love nothing more than for you to think of him as a cartoon figure. Because as long as you think of him as a cartoon figure, you will not take him seriously. But the real Satan is so much more dangerous and crafty and subtle. And if he can just do one thing, he'll have you. And that one thing is this. He wants to make you think that you don't need Jesus to die on the cross for you. He wants to make you think you don't need Jesus to die in your place on the cross. He does not want you to cherish that old rugged cross. And if he can plant that seed in your heart, if he can lead you to think that way, then you will live like you do not need Jesus to die on the cross for your sins. And we need to know that we're all like Simon Peter when it comes to this temptation. When Jesus says, Simon, Simon, I'm warning you, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. What does Simon Peter say? Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. I would never betray you. I would never. I would never succumb to temptation. I'm too strong for that. I'm Peter. I'm Peter. I'm the rock. Remember you gave me that name? Oh no, I would never. And you may be thinking something similar. Well, I would never question the need for Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. I would never doubt the worthiness of Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. But you see, all that Satan has to do is get you to think that I just need to follow Jesus. I just need to respect Jesus. I just need to esteem Jesus. I just need to think highly of Jesus. I just need to try to follow his example. I, need, I just need to give for Jesus, or give to Jesus, or sacrifice for Jesus. And that'll be good enough, right? If that's your attitude, then you don't realize what the evil one is trying to do. He wants you to think highly of Jesus. Yes, yes, listen to Jesus, follow Jesus. Just don't think he needs to die on the cross for you. Don't think that the only way you can stand before a holy and righteous God is because of his shed blood for you. That's the idea that he wants to plant within us. And that seed will grow. So that we begin to think, I would never, I would never give in. Peter's attitude is, bring it on. Bring on the temptation. I'm strong enough. I can take it. I'm ready, Jesus. And what did Jesus tell him? I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. And it's no accident that Jesus first says to him, Simon, Simon. Hearkening back to his given name. Simon, remember who you are apart from me. You're Simon. You're a fisherman. Despite all your gusto, all your boasting, all your self-confidence, I know who you are. You're Simon. Simon, Simon, he repeats it for emphasis. Remember who you are apart from me. And we see just how correct Jesus is. Simon says, I would never. Jesus says, 
Yes, you will. And is it because Peter's confronted by a Roman soldier? Is it because he's confronted by one of the temple police? Because he's hauled in before the religious leaders? No. Who does he cave in against? A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, That man was with us. A servant girl, this girl someone who, who was overlooked and, and discredited by everyone else. She called him out. And Peter the Rock wilts. He completely falls apart. No, woman, I don't know him. I don't know him. A little later, someone says, You're one of them. Man, no, I'm not. Leave me alone. Just trying to keep warm in this fire. The fire number says, no, 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 no. You hear that accent? This guy's from Galilee. <laughs> There's no masking that accent. You are from Galilee. You are with him. Man, I don't know what you're talking about. I would never. No, no. And then here we go. One of the startling scenes in all of Scripture. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Looked him in the eyes. As Jesus is, is on trial for his life, he looks through the door of the window and he sees Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him before the rooster crows today. You will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Feel the impact of that. Jesus looking at you, looking at me. And you remember, for all our times of thinking, I would never do that. I would never give in to temptation. I would never forsake my Lord. I would never deny him. I would never disown him. No, no, no. I, I, I couldn't. And it is at this point, as Peter is weeping bitterly, that he's finally reached the point of knowing saving faith. To know that the only kind of faith that is unshakable, that will remain in the sin after it is shaken by Satan, is faith in Christ alone. Saving faith, it is only available by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And we see that what finally becomes of all of our zeal and our enthusiasm, our best efforts, our sacrifices, all these things, Come up short of the end. They will let us down. We cannot point to any of them when we stand before a holy and righteous God. You think of those words from Proverbs 28, verse 26. Those who trust in themselves are fools. But those who walk in wisdom are kept safe. What is the beginning of wisdom? The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. You don't know wisdom, no matter how intelligent you may be, no matter how, I, how high your IQ might be, you don't know wisdom, the kind of wisdom that keeps you safe until your heart has been set right with God. Those who trust in themselves are fools. Those who say, I would never, are fools. Those who are leaning on anything and everything but the shed blood of Jesus in their place are fools. And that's not to call them 
unintelligent. It's to say, to look at yourself and to think that you have what it takes to be holy, to be righteous before God. You have yet to pour contempt on all. The main things that charm us most. So many main things that charm us, but what charms us the most? Our own pride. Our own independence. Our own belief in ourselves. No, down with all of that poor contempt on such pride. It only leads to what we see in Peter, weeping bitterly before the Lord Jesus, when he says, I told you, I'm not going to the cross for nothing. I'm not going to the cross because I want to. I'm not going to the cross because it's going to be fun. I'm not doing it just to set an example of what it looks like to die as a martyr. There are plenty of those. I'm dying on the cross to save my people because there's no other way. Are you convinced today that there is no other way for you to be justified before God except Christ and Christ alone. If that's what you believe, if you're with Peter to weep bitterly, to say, no, I would, I would, I would forsake him. I cannot withstand Satan's sifting. I cannot withstand this by my own willpower, by my own enthusiasm, by my own sacrifices, however great they may be. Here is beautiful speaking words of the Lord Jesus. Verse 36. But I have prayed for you, Simon. I have prayed for you. Jesus says, I have prayed for you in the singular. Not y'all, you, Peter, that your faith may not fail. So that however much Peter's faith may falter, it's ultimately refining his faith. It's purifying his faith. It's exposing all the things that are contaminants to his faith. All of his pride, all of his ambition, all of his self-satisfaction, it's gone that your faith may not fail, so that when your life is shaken out by the accuser, what remains is saving faith. Faith that is in Christ and in Christ alone. As you look to the cross today, do you believe that you can only be saved because Jesus has prayed for you individually? By name. The prayer of Jesus is powerful. We can't be saved by our own prayers. What grounds do I have to call upon God? On what basis can I say, God, please do this for me? But Jesus, Jesus is the one about whom the Father said, This is my Son. With Him I am well pleased. Listen to Him. And Jesus says in the Gospel of John, chapter 11, verse 42, Father, I know that you always hear me. I'm saying this for the benefit of those who are hearing me, but I know that you always hear me. I'm your beloved Son. And He shows just how beloved He is when He goes to the cross, when He is obedient to the point of death when he perfectly fulfills God's righteous commands and the Father vindicates him by raising him back to life. And not only that, Jesus ascends to the right hand of God the Father, meaning he is now in the position to judge every single one of us. And it is only when he intercedes for us, when he prays for us, that we have the grounds to be in the presence of God. The 
into 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. We have an advocate. He's praying for me right now. Do you believe he's praying for you right now? Do you have that assurance in your heart? And you have that assurance that you can say, I have no grounds for staying before God. I've reached the end of myself. My sins, just like Peter, condemn me. When Jesus looks at me, I know I'm not worthy. I've let him down. I know that Satan, the accuser, has plenty of material on me. Even when other people think I'm a moral, upstanding, good person, Satan knows. I have an accuser who can say, other people may think that, but I know what he did last week. I know what he thought last week. I know what he said. I know what she thought. But now in Christ, because he's praying for his people by name, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So that now when the Father looks at you and, and Satan is hurling his accusations, what about this? What about that? Jesus says, look for my obedience and my righteousness. My blood is sufficient to atone for her sins. My blood is sufficient to cleanse his heart. It is enough. Do you believe the blood of Jesus is enough for you today? His love and his prayer is so powerful. It's also compassion. He says, Simon, I have prayed for you, knowing, knowing what's about to happen the same night. It's not that Jesus is ignorant of that. It's not that Jesus thinks that Simon won't do this. He knows. He knows the betrayal of Simon. He knows your betrayal and my betrayal. He knows how we wilt in the face of temptation. And he still prays for us. He still prays for us. The compassion, the mercy, the patience, the love of Christ to pray for his people, to intercede for his people, to advocate for his people. Before the Father. Are you thankful for that? Do you know that today? Are you trusting in Christ and in Christ alone for your salvation? Are you still drawing your own good deeds? Do you still think that if you work hard enough, you can be a good person? Maybe if you think some other saint can pray for you, maybe then you'll be on God's good side. There is nothing we can do. There is nothing we can pray. There is nothing we can offer to get on God's good side. Are you clear about that? It is only Jesus and what he's done for us that can justify us. And if you have been set right, if you believe that you are justified by the blood of Christ, if you have saving faith, if you have accepted and received what Christ has done, and you are resting what Christ has done. Look at the instructions that Jesus gives to Peter. I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And indeed, his faith did not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. When you have repented, When you have turned back, when you realize the weight of your sinfulness, strengthen your brothers. And that's a word for us today, too. Strengthen your brothers and sisters. If you believe that Jesus is enough to save you, then who are you going to encourage today? We don't come to this table alone. We come to this table with our brothers and sisters, those who have been purchased by the blood of Christ, our blood-bought family. And we have a responsibility 
to speak the name of Jesus, the saving name of Jesus, into the lives of our brothers and sisters. We have a responsibility to be on the lookout for those who are struggling, who are weak in the face of temptation. Strengthen them. Who are you going to strengthen this Holy Week? Who are you going to encourage this Holy Week? Who are you going to point to Jesus? Not to tell him it's okay, it'll be alright, or you're good enough. Just hang in there. No, Jesus is enough. Who are you going to tell? To whom are you going to bear witness? The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Strengthen your brothers and sisters. When you're ready to do that, you're ready to approach the table. You're ready to be nourished by God's grace, by these symbols that point us to this. You're ready to say, I don't deserve to come to this table, but by God's grace, He's invited me, and I'm going to come. I'm going to receive what Jesus has done. Let's go ahead and pray now. Father, we pour contempt on all our As we approach this table on this holy week, I pray that you would call to mind the many ways that we have fallen short of your glory. This past week, maybe even today, we have all fallen short of your glory. And your word tells us that the wages of sin is death. We deserve death. We deserve what Peter deserved. We confess that, like Peter, we have failed you, we have let you down. We are not enough. We are not sufficient. Lord, we have reached the end of ourselves. But I pray that as we humble ourselves before you, that you, by your grace, would lift us up and that we would hear your invitation to enjoy your presence around this land. I pray that we would be enlivened and encouraged and strengthened by this simple yet powerful meal. This meal that you gave to us, you left for us so that we might remember, remember what you've done for us. Lord, help us to remember today. For we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.